All right, please rise for the Star Spangled Banner. Joining us this evening on the Star Spangled Banner is Ryuko Tanaka. Ms. Tanaka? Thank you, Ms. Tanaka. Okay, we have the Minutemen High School kids selling us cookies and other baked products. Quiet, please. Are there any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Quiet, please. Shh. Quiet. What the heck's going on? Any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Seeing none. Recognize the chair of the board of selectmen, Mr. Dan Dunn. You heard this all uh, last week. It is requested that the members of the board of selectmen and elected officials of the town, town manager, departments of the heads of town and staff, superintendent of schools and staff, committees, commissions, and boards of the town, Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical District Committee, and superintendent members of the Electronic Voting Committee and staff members of General Court representing Ar Arlington and also any consultants have been retained for work of the town relative to the articles be acted on this meeting. Representatives of the interested party of Article 1, representatives of the news media, be permitted to sim sit within the special town meeting enclosure. <laughs> Who's going to second it? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. You may have noticed we're in the special town meeting now, not the regular. Um, Madam Clerk, do you have reason to believe that this meeting was appropriately called by the Board of Selectmen and that the constable made a return of service on the warrant in accordance with the laws? She, she certifies and declares in the affirmative. Mr. Dunn. It is moved that if all business of this meeting as set forth in the warrant and the special annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 7th, 2018 at 8 p.m. All in favor? Aye. All in favor of ending tonight? Aye. Clicker test. Get your clickers out. Tim's going to give us a test. All righty. Our question tonight, on the seal of the United States, does it mean one out of many? One out of many. Is that what the seal means of the U.S.? One for yes, two for no. One out of many. Hundred sixty five. <laughs> okay, the nose win, it mean what it actually means is many out of one. So you got your Latin backwards. All right, any we um any announce Mr. Hainer, announcements. Announcements are limited to four meeting by our by
four minutes by our bylaws. Mr. Moderator, uh, Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. On May 25th, the Thompson third graders will be having their town meeting at 9 a.m. where they will present, debate, and vote on articles. You're welcome to see future town meetings in action. Members. Uh, the Town of Arlington Memorial Day ceremony will con be conducted on May 28th at 9.30 in the morning at Town Hall Auditorium. Keynote speaker will be Marine Colonel uh, Michael Strobel. In the afternoon, the Arlington Department of Veterans Services, in partnership with the Regent Theatre, will offer a pre-screening of Taking Chance on Memorial Day. Doors open at 1.30. Following the screening, Lieutenant Colonel Strobel will be available for questions and answers during the discussion. This is a movie that Kevin Bacon starred in. It, uh, he, uh, the role he plays is Colonel Strobel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanner. Anyone else on report? Uh, announcements, sir. Brendan Sullivan, Precinct 2. I'll be much shorter than four minutes, but I uh, just wanted to make a quick announcement. Um, I had someone here from, uh, scheduled from DCF to come make a quick announcement, introduction, how to get involved if anyone's interested in foster care or adoption or anything. Um, they're actually right here in Arlington, and they serve a huge uh, area, but we're lucky enough to have them right here in Arlington. Um, I ran out, uh, but they did provide me with some of these pamphlets you might see on your seat, um, but that's about it. Just wanted to make Thank you, sir. Any other announcements? Well, all I can do is talk louder. We, <laughs> yeah, we don't have any speakers up there. They're all down here. So everyone speak clearly and loudly for the folks up in the hall. Any other announcements? Ma'am. Naomi Greenfield, Precinct 15, and co-chair of the Arlington Human Rights Commission. This morning, on my way to meet my running group at the Arlington High School track, I was stunned and disgusted to see a hateful anti-gay slur spray painted on the parking lot pavement next to my car. A few steps away, a similar sentiment was scrawled on the building itself with a swastika on a nearby trash barrel. I took photos of the graffiti and notified the Arlington Police Department, who were on the scene before I even finished one lap on the track. And the Rainbow Commission, the Department of Health and Human Services, the DPW, the Board of Selectmen, the Superintendent, Principal Janger, the Town Manager, and the Diversity Task Group were already notified and starting to take action before I had even finished breakfast. This, my fellow town meeting members, is how we do things in Arlington. We should be very proud of this immediate response and the seriousness with which every group treated this incident. Unfortunately, as I learned later this morning, these hate messages outside the school were not the only damage done. There was extensive vandalism throughout the high school from what we now know as 11 or so individuals, many of whom were caught on surveillance cameras. As the co-chair of the Arlington Human Rights Commission, I have now been privy to hear about too many hate-inspired incidents in Arlington. In the year and a half that I've been on the commission, we have seen the number of these incidences rise, whether it be swastikas, hateful graffiti, or racist, ethnic, anti-gay, or anti-Semitic spoken language on the bike path, on private property, and in ba school bathrooms. As we talked about last week, words and language matter, and these hateful words scrolled in our public spaces, in the spaces our educators, students, school building workers, and visitors frequent are unacceptable, offensive, and frankly, just disgusting. So tonight, here at town meeting, on behalf of the Arlington Human Rights Commission, I would like to state that here in Arlington, we are constantly striving and fighting to be an inclusive, welcoming, and equitable community. Incidents and human rights violations like this and others that we have responded to have absolutely and unequivocally no place in Arlington. This is not who we are. That said, if you or someone you know ever feels unsafe or that they are being targeted or treated unfairly or attacked in any way because of their race, gender, ethnicity, or religion, please notify the AHRC and the APD as soon as possible. If you see hate graffiti, like what I saw this morning, please take a picture of it and share it with us as soon as possible. 
Please also take a moment during the break tonight to introduce yourselves and connect with the current AHRC commissioners, as there are several of us in the room tonight who also serve as town meeting members. And I'd like actually the town Arlington Human Rights Commission and town meeting members to stand up. Um, we have Dave Swanson, who's the other co-chair of the committee in Precinct 5, Christine Carney in Precinct 11, Sherry Barron in Precinct 7, and Bill Logan in Precinct 2. We would I want to especially thank the AHS principal, Janger, for his swift response and impressive mobilizing of the entire AHS community on what should have been a beautiful spring day. I encourage you all to stop by AHS to see the beautiful response and positive messaging that the students chalked on the outside of the building today. And thank you also to the Rainbow Commission, who I know you'll hear from shortly, for partnering us to craft a beautiful, thoughtful, and empowering statement, which I encourage you all to read. And lastly, I want to ask all of you, everyone in the room, everyone who is in the balcony, that in addition to the important role we play as town officials or town meeting members or visitors, I'd like to ask every one of you tonight to commit to being an upstander and not a bystander. When you hear someone, your friend, your family member, your coworker, a person on the T, on the street, on the internet, or in the park, when you hear someone say something derogatory about someone who looks, lives, or loves different than yourselves, it is your job to speak up. The people who wrote this hateful language have likely also spoken that same hateful language out loud in public and to other people. Let's stop this hate as soon as we hear it. That is our job as citizens, as residents of Arlington, and as human beings. It is our job to make sure that Arlington is a place for all. Thank you. Thank you. Other announcements? Either, any mic. Yep. Um, Anna Watson, uh, and I am the chair of the Rainbow Commission. And Mr. Moderator, I ask that the LGBTQIA plus Rainbow Commission's annual report be received. Okay, we'll take the report and we'll submit it under reports when it gets to reports. But what? we will take the report. All in favor of receiving the report, please say yes. Yes. Thank Close. you. It is so received. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And if I could have maybe just a couple of extra minutes to also respond to the uh, hate incidents incident of today. Just make a motion for an extra three minutes or seven minutes total. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? You have your seven minutes. Thank you very much. So um, I also would like to take a minute to let you know that because there are some new town meeting members here that we do have a vacancy on the Rainbow Commission. And then on a more somber note, uh, referencing the hate incident that Naomi spoke so beautifully about, and I second um, her thoughts about how important it was that we showed up here together as um, people in Arlington who do not do not feel these hateful feelings. And um, so I also want to thank Principal Janger for um, fostering a community at the Arlington High School where not only um, are there visible uh, offerings of love in the, in the front of the building, they also had a, I believe they had an assembly today where student government and club leaders and my favorite athletic captains um, joined to express solidarity with their classmates around this incident. Um, I do, however, find the timing of this hate incident particularly poignant, as only a handful of days ago, the parent of a queer eighth grader was saying how grateful they are to be living in such a safe and tolerant community for the sake of their child. Uh, it is also sad and ironic that this incident comes on the heels of an extremely well-attended presentation about hate symbols sponsored by the Human Rights Commission and the Anti-Defamation League. However, as a lesbian resident of Arlington for the past 20-some years, I have the lived experience of the gap between good intentions and good outcomes. In fact, this is one of the reasons this body created the Rainbow Commission 
because we know that anti-queer hatred runs deep, is passed on from generation to generation, and has not yet been eradicated by making technical fixes such as marriage equality. The reason quick fixes are not enough is because these advances can be sabotaged as we are seeing with the ballot question this November to overturn hard-won protections for the trans community. In order for there to be lasting generational and cultural change, we need all hands on deck, and we need to make sure that all Arlingtonians have access to real information about queer people's real lives and real history. Although today's incident at our high school is incredibly distressing, we must not be discouraged. We must view this as a wake-up call and an opportunity to put into play our very real good intentions. And we're so excited that our town's newest commission will give us opportunities to move further in this direction, to move in the direction where we can um, go beyond responding to hate incidents and presenting macro-level educational events to involving the many diverse subgroups within the larger queer community in discussion of how to meet their differing needs. And I'm thinking about this parent I, talked about, I spoke about earlier as well as the parents of queer youth who I work with who, whose families are now inextricably and intimately linked with the queer community. So if you would like to discuss this hate incident or any other pertinent matters, please email the Rainbow Commission at rainbow at town.arlington.ma.us or come to our next meeting, which is Thursday, May 17th at 6.30 p.m. in the Board of Health Conference Room at the Senior Center, 27 Maple Street. Now I'll get to the report, thank you. Town meeting established the Rainbow Commission with the purpose of promoting equality-affirming policies regarding the full spectrum of sexual orientations and gender identities and bringing greater visibility and empowerment to the LGBTQIA population through education, advocacy, and collaboration with other town agencies, schools, and community groups. The Rainbow Commission has seven members, six appointed by the town manager, and subject to the approval of the Board of Selectmen, and one appointed by the school committee. The first Rainbow Commission meeting was held this March. I am the chair, and Mel Goldsipe is the vice chair. Other members are Bill Gardner, Brooks Harrelson, Lisa Krinsky, and Helene Newberg. Rainbow Commissioners who are here tonight, could you please stand? So unfortunately, one of the original commissioners had to move out of town, so we currently have a vacancy. Anyone interested can apply to the town manager with a resume, a letter of interest indicating why you're interested in joining the commission, your connection to the queer community, and how you think you can help advance the commission's work. In the coming year, the Rainbow Commission will analyze results from the Vision 2020 survey questions from 2015 and the Human Rights Commission's online needs assessment survey from 2016. That information, supplemented with additional community input, will be used to develop a mission statement and a five-year plan for the commission, in addition to guiding some short-term projects. The human, rights the, excuse me, the human Rights Campaign is the largest national lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer civil rights organization. And each year this group evaluates how inclusive municipal laws, policies, and services are of LGBTQ plus people who live and work in a particular municipality. Cities and towns are rated based on non-discrimination laws, the town as an employer, town services, law enforcement, and the town leadership's public position on equality and gives them a score between one and 100. Arlington is among over 500 cities and towns, including in this annual evaluation, and the criteria change from year to year. The Rainbow Commission is currently compiling suggestions for how to improve Arlington's score by implementing changes to improve visibility, inclusion, and general quality of life for our queer community. We expect that these steps will include official recognition of Pride Month, a table at Town Day, and free health screenings, including HIV tests. 
The commission also hopes to host educational events in advance of the ballot question regarding statewide non-discrimination protections for transgender and gender non-conforming people in public spaces like restaurants, public transportation, and hospitals. These protections under SB 2407 have been in effect since 2016, and the Rainbow Commission strongly supports voting yes on this ballot question in November. Our short annual report is on the back table, posted to the Commission's webpage on the town website. The Rainbow Commission looks forward to providing a full report to town meeting next year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Watson. <clears throat> Any other, any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, reports of committees. Article one, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Moderator, I move that the Board of Selectmen's report be received. All in favor receive the Board of Selectmen report, please say yes. yes. Opposed? It is so received. Ow. Charlie. Mr. Moderator, I move that the recommended votes contained in the respective report of the Board of Selectmen before the meeting without further motion. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Mr. Moderator, I uh, move that Article 1 be laid upon the table. All in favor? Yes. Opposed? Redevelopment Board report. We, we're going to take it off the table just for you. Go ahead. Right. It's off the table. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Andrew Bunnell, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. I move that the ARB report be accepted. All in favor of accepting the report of the Arlington ARB, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? So received. Now I'm going to make a motion to put Article 1 back on the table. Right. Oh, you have a report? Al Adam's got a report, so let's not vote on that yet. I'm just too anxious. Holy smokes. Are you going to read that to us? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Adam Chaplin, Town Manager. I wanted to uh, provide a brief report on uh, an update on the activities of the Arlington High School Building Committee. Uh, so I, I suppose we could uh, submit this handout that's been placed on all of your chairs as a report to the town meeting of the High School Building Committee, <coughs> if, if appropriate. So again, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Uh, I just wanted to walk through very quickly on where we've been, where we are now in the high school building planning process, and then where we think we'll be going over the course of the next several years. So as some of you may recall, uh, back in April of 2015, the town submitted a statement of interest to the MSBA to uh, get into their pipeline for the high school building um, project, and they accepted us uh, in January of 2016. Later in 2016, this town meeting appropriated $2 million for a feasibility study, and then that passed townwide on a ballot, uh, a $2 million debt exclusion to pay for that feasibility study. And we officially started the feasibility phase in February of 2017. We established a building committee, we hired an owner's project manager, and we hired an architect, all by the fall of 2017. Very quickly, I wanted to run through the members of the building committee. We have a 19-member community, uh, uh, excuse me, 19-member committee that's uh, quite representative of the community. Um, if you're here, uh, if you could just stand up, because I, I think a lot of you are here tonight. We have Jeff Thielman, a uh, member of the school committee who's chairing the school building committee. We have Dr. Kathleen Bodie, the superintendent of schools. I serve on the committee. Karen Tassoni serves as the recording secretary of the committee, and she works in the superintendent's office. We have Chrissy Allison Ampey, uh, now chair of the school committee. We have Frank Callahan, member of the community. We have John Cole, a member of the permanent town building committee. We have John Denizio, the CFO for the public schools. Toby Jackson, a community member. Matthew Janger, the high school principal. Ryan Katowski, a community member. Kate Lucian, a community member. Bill McCarthy, the assistant principal of the high school. Steve Nesterak, the facilities director. Judson Pierce, a community member and former school committee member. Sandy Pooler, the deputy town manager. Brian Rarig, a community member and member of the capital planning committee. Dan Ruiz, a community member and Amy Speer, a member of the community. They've been putting in a lot of hours, so I, I suppose a round of applause is, uh, is appropriate. <clears throat> so this committee's been working very hard um, to manage this process. 
uh, educational visioning sessions were put together with the high school faculty, district leaders, and community members, and those took place in January and February of 2018. Public forums were held on January 10th, February 13th, March 5th, and April 4th to update the community and gather input from the community on design concepts. The high school building committee evaluated alternate sites and determined that the current site, though difficult and challenging, was still the most viable option. The high school building committee also deemed that a renovation only option was unsuitable because it would not address enrollment growth, the desired uh, adjacencies of programming, and it cannot accommodate all of the existing programs and services. Based on all of that, the architectural firm presented eight preliminary massing concepts in March, and then in April, the building committee selected four concepts to explore further and refine. So if those slides are up, if we can just quickly run through these slides, I won't spend a lot of time on them, but the op there's four options now, and they are a mix of options that build on the back of the site and retain the existing stru uh, historical um, structures of historical nature. There's options that build on the front of the site and, uh, and retain those structures. And there's two all new options, one that spreads over the, uh, over the entire site and one that builds almost entirely on the front of the site. So based on that work, that giant book uh, that's right there was submitted to the MSBA. That's called the Preliminary Design Program, or the PDB, uh, PDP. I'm not usually a prop comic, but uh, the committee insisted that I show how hard they've been working and how many documents have been put together. <laughs> Going forward, a public forum will be held on June 4th to provide further details on the four preliminary concepts. There'll be floor plans, conceptual diagrams and space adjacencies, conceptual site plans, interior and exterior ar uh, architectural feel and street level perspectives and construction timeline estimates. Based on that, in July, we'll submit one preferred option to the MSBA. Assuming the MSBA agrees with us, they'll approve us entering into schematic design phase, which would begin in the fall of 2018, and we would be working towards a spring debt exclusion vote in the spring of 2019. If that passes, phased construction could begin as early as spring 2020 and last anywhere from two to four years. Then one more quick point, if you'll entertain it, Mr. Moderator, is there's been, um, there's been a lot of numbers discussed, and right now those four options that you saw on the screen behind me range from $287 million to $298 million, and those are strictly based on square footage multiplied by industry square footage costs. Those are not detailed design or cost estimates, uh, but they're ballpark estimates, again, based on square footage. And just to provide some perspective, uh, Belmont is a little bit ahead of us in the planning process for their high school and their cost estimates right now for a school of a similar size are coming in over $300 million. Waltham's significantly ahead of us in the process and they have more refined cost estimates and they're looking at $283 million. And Somerville's going to construction this spring and they're building a smaller school than we're looking at building because there's less students and their, um, their figure is $255 million. I only offer those to provide uh, perspective for what we're dealing with, but also to provide assurance that we will be working hard to make the number as reasonable as possible as the design goes forward. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Okay, any other reports? Okay, now I'll make a motion to lay Article 1 upon the table. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, what we're going to we're in the special right now. What we're, we're going to do is put the special in recess, go back, finish the budgets, finish the two or three articles in the regular town meeting, and then come back and do the special in one fell swoop. So we're going to, all in favor of recessing the special, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? The special is in recess. That brings us to Article 29, number 20, Budget 21, Inspections. Someone wanted to talk about the inspectional department. Hmm? No, um, oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm, libraries. Someone helped. We did education. 23, libraries. Who wanted to ask about libraries? No one. Okay. Going once, going twice, libraries is done. The next budget, Health and Human Services. Someone held Health and Human Services. No one? Going once, going twice. Next budget we have that was held is Recreation. Right. 
Mr. Verglue, then Mr. Um, Yonter. Mr. Um, Verglue, Precinct 10. Um, I think I understand that this might have been because of reclassification from revolving funds, but um, from 2018 to 2019, there's close to a million dollar change both in expenses and revenues. And in terms of new positions under expenses, there's a comment on revolving funds there. Um, I want to understand if the, uh, the revenues followed those positions. Um, I can rationalize all kinds of things, but I thought I'd ask the question instead. Thank you, John Marshall, Director of Recreation. Uh, you are correct. Um, the, in reviewing the budget over the course of this past year um, and reviewing the um, changes that were made to the mass modernization bill, um, the full-time salaries that we were paying out of one of our revolving funds, um, we needed to move those over to our enterprise fund, so we actually moved um, all of our expenses over to the enterprise fund. Um, so that accounts for the million dollars. There is one request that is different, um, and that is the assistant director position. Uh, everything else f that was in the revolving fund and the positions that were in the revolving fund have moved over to the enterprise fund. And, and so that would include the revenues that were in that revolving Correct. fund? Correct. Well. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Hunter? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Team Morkaya Yontar, Precinct 7. Um, I was trying to see if the previous answer covered some. I don't, didn't think it did. So uh, the first, sorry, the second line, operating expenses, there's a change of about three quarters of a million dollars here, a 269% increase over the previous year. Is that also a, um, a change in accounting as, from uh, previous years? Mr. Marshall? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yes, that is correct. That's accounting. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank all the town officials who answered my questions on Monday and today about the town budget. Their responses have been clear and informative, and I think we've learned that where we see notable cost increases, either they're an accounting matter uh, that's balanced out by cost reductions elsewhere, or they're just moving funds from category to category, or they represent expenses that are truly necessary, such as running extra elections, protecting our tree canopy, uh, catching up on, on deferred maintenance or incremental costs of building a new school and opening a new school. And in short, I'd say the town is running a tight fiscal ship and its, office, uh, its officials are acting um, as prudent stewards of our citizens' tax dollars. So thank you all again for, for uh, your answers and for your hard work. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Jamison? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Chamberson, Precinct 12. First, I want to concur on the previous speaker's uh, compliments to the, uh, the management of the town uh, on large. Um, so on those expenses that were changed from a revolving fund, was that a revolving fund that was under the auspices of the Board of Selectmen that we see every year? Um, my memory may have failed me, but I don't remember seeing that previously. So are there revolving funds that exist that aren't under that list? Um, this one is not. Uh, it's uh, okay. under Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 53D. Uh, it is specific to recreation departments. When that was initially authorized back in whatever town meeting took place, which I am, I'm actually not sure, it was probably uh, after 1980 when Prop 2 and a half passed, um, that would have been authorized initially, and then it doesn't need reauthorization every year. Okay, and so... Um, uh, in the future, to the extent possible, it would be good for um, both on the town and the school side for other revolving funds to be given more, um, to get be, be presented to the town uh, meeting in a report, if possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Anything else on recreation? Seeing none. <clears throat>
closes recreation. Ed Burns Arena. Mr. Christiana. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Greg Christiana, Precinct 15. Under personnel services detail, uh, there was a similar uh, 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 row for principal, clerk, and typist from the uh, select board section, as there is here, and there's a noticeable increase, 160% over last year, and about 50% uh, over the high water mark before that over the last few years. Can someone uh, speak to both the variability and the significant increase this year in particular? Mr. Marshall? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. Um, Introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, John Marshall, Director of Recreation. Um, in looking at the principal clerk typist, um, you'll see that uh, last year, there's those four uh, items. Uh, last year, it said uh, 0.19. Um, that number should be 0.13. And then under the senior clerk and typist position, uh, it went from 0.23 to 0.68, that 0.68 should be 0.23. I see. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else on um, Ed Burns Arena? That closes that. The next budget that was held is that's it. There are no more budgets held. Any other questions on the budgets? If not, we're ready for a vote on Article 29. So we're going to vote all at once. All in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee as presented in their report under Article 29, please press 1 for yes and 2 for no. 1 for yes, 2 for no. It's an affirmative vote, 197 in the positive, one in the negative. And that closes Article 29. The next article coming up is number 35. Uh, appropriations for committees and commissions. We had this on the consent agenda. Somebody took it off. Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. I note that in this uh, particular article, we have a rather larger than other budgets budget for the Arlington um, Arts and Cultural Commission that has recently been created. And I'm wondering whether somebody could walk us through. My understanding is this is partly consolidation of other items, but I think there's some rationale for that increase. And I was hoping someone could explain it to the meeting. Mr. Chapdelaine, can you answer her question, please? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So this is, a, this is an increase from the $25,000 uh, allocation uh, for the Cultural Commission last year. Uh, and the primary, um, the primary increase was to, um, once again, support the public art consultant while also supporting the activities of the commission. So I can quickly run through the details of the budget. Um, they are budgeting $2,500 for website maintenance, $2,500 for the support of an online interactive calendar, uh, $25 for the web URL, $250 for a hosting fee, uh, paying $6,000 for a cultural district coordinator and webmaster, uh, allocating $5,000 for uh, programs and festivals like the Arlington Alive Festival, another $5,000 uh, to go towards grants to support the Cultural Council uh, State Grant Fund, so to supplement that money that is received from the grant. $500 for the Poet Laureate Program as an honorarium for the Poet Laureate. Uh, and then some smaller amounts, uh, $45 um, to participate in Town Day, and a membership in the Americans for the Arts Association of $75, and administrative costs of $605. That adds up to the $25,000. An additional $15,000 has been put aside uh, to... Uh, once again engage with a public art consultant to both program further public art and the community but also to help implement the cultural district 
Great. Thank you very much. I just felt like people would want to know. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Court. Uh, Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, while doing a little bit of research on this particular article, it has come to my attention that for the first time in over about 20 years, that an extra sentence has been added to the vote. In the past 20 years or so, the comment in the italicized or what we're actually voting on used to stop at the words committees and boards. This year, for some unknown reason, an extra sentence, all consultant services shall be supervised under the direction of the town manager. As far as I could tell, there's been no literature distributed around the hall in regards to what this entails, what is meant by the consultant services, why this has been added to this particular article, uh, what I would like to do, Mr. Moderator, is where it is possibly going to be the late last night of town meeting, I would like to submit a motion to delete that particular sentence until such time as we could get more information on it, and if need be, maybe have it presented under this article at a future special town meeting so that at that particular time we'll be able to debate it more and find out what the proponent of this information is actually looking for instead of tying up valuable time at town meeting tonight. Why don't we just ask them what's meant by that sentence and why they decided it was necessary to insert it in this year's um, recommended vote as opposed to going through. I'm I leery, saw several hands go up already to. I'm leery to the fact that Mr. Moderator that where this has never been happened under this particular article in 20 years, it might open up a future problem of more people turning around and saying, well, we okay, did it Okay, well, Mr. Leonard, then may I suggest you write your motion out and submit it? I have a motion in front of me, sir. Okie dokie. All right, your, your motion's before some. Anything else on, on that? I'll take a copy of that, Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. Uh, that language was included, and I'll certainly defer to any additional um, information uh, from the Finance Committee if they'd like to, to add on to what I'll say. But uh, in our initial budget submission to the Finance Committee, we had budgeted or recommended a budget of $25,000 for the commission and included in the planning department's budget $15,000 for the public art consultant based on an, uh, an understanding between the commission and my office and the planning office that it was easier for a town department to manage consultant services than, uh, than a commission of volunteers. Through the dialogue with the finance committee, they felt that putting all of the costs in one one section under the commission's jurisdiction, so it was clear how much was being spent on arts and culture was what their preference was, but that by adding that line, they could still achieve the goal of having the Planning and Community Development Office manage, uh, manage the consultant's time. So I, that was sort of a part of the, part of the sausage making, uh, budget making process that resulted in that language being included, and I think it's prudent inclusion uh, to help the commission reach its goals. Thank you, sir. Mr. Foskett. Mr. Moderator, Charlie Foskett, Precinct 8, and Vice Chairman of the Finance Committee. Uh, I think um, Mr. Chapdelaine's uh, addressed the subject very eloquently. Uh, I would just like to add that uh, it was the firm decision of the Finance Committee that um, these consulting services would be um, uh, better observed and, and managed if the town manager had his, had his eye on it, and therefore um, we agreed that it would be under the supervision of the town manager. Thank you. Mr. Carmen, did you wish to speak to the issue? No. Mr. Schlickman, did you wish to speak to the issue? 
Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under all items under Article 35. Second. Motion to terminate debate under all Articles 35. Please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Debate is terminated. We have before us first Mr. Leonard's motion to delete the line that says all consultant services shall be supervised under the direction of the town manager. Um, as soon as Mr. Lathwood's ready, we'll take a vote on Mr. Leonard's motion. If you're in favor of Mr. Leonard's motion, please press one. If you're against Mr. Leonard's motion, please press two. It's a negative vote, 187 in the negative, 15 in the positive. The motion is defeated. That brings us to the recommended vote of the Finance Committee as printed in your report. All in favor of the recommended vote, please press one for yes, two for no, as soon as we get the green light. Here we go, one for yes, two for no of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee. It's an affirmative vote, 195 in the positive, six in the negative, and that ends Article 35. The next item we have to take up is Article 42. OPEB. Anyone wish to discuss OPEB? Ms. LaCourte. Annie LaCourte, Precinct 15. I requested that this article and Article 45 be taken off of the consent agenda because both of these are appropriations of money um, that involve some arcane terms that many of us are familiar with but that new town meeting members probably have no information about. And so I'd like to request, Mr. Moderator, if it's all right, just as we did last year, if I could ask the town manager to explain both what we mean by other post-employment benefits and what we mean by free cash and how these, and why we do this to the new town meeting members, and then I don't have to get up for Article 45. Okay. I th Mr. Chapdelaine could do that, but I think maybe next year, Ms. LaCourt, mm -hmm. let's, um, let's do this during the new town meeting orientation in instead uh, of doing it during the um, actual meeting itself. I would Mr. be Chapdelaine? happy to do that if all the meeting members attend. We had a good, we had a good turnout. We had a very good turnout. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chapsley, Town Manager. Uh, so OPEB is not a conglomeration of oil producing countries. It actually, <laughs> it actually refers to um, retiree health care costs uh, associated with our retirees and the health care that they, health care that they receive, health care uh, insurance that they receive. So several years ago, or ma many years ago, towns were, start, uh, were required to start looking at what their long-term liability was, much like we look at our long-term retirement liability, uh, to be able to put these costs on our, our balance sheets for the annual audit. And every, uh, every other year, we do an update to that liability um, and present, uh, present on that. Arlington also has been a leader in putting money aside for that liability, and that's what this vote is, to put money aside into a trust uh, strictly for, uh, for OPEB or retiree health costs. So I can read you some quick numbers. As of January 1st, 2016, uh, that's the last actuarial study that was done on our OPEB liability. Um, one as of January 1, 2018 will be uh, ready fairly soon, but it's not ready yet. So if we, if we look at the breakdown, our total OPEB liability as of that date was $201 million. At that point, we had accumulated assets toward the liability of $8.9 million, though I think today that number is closer to $11 million, which led, uh, left us with a total unfunded liability of $192 million. To break that down even further, the amount of that liability associated with current retirees was 56% or $111 million, 
and the percentage of that liability associated with active employees was 44% or $87 million. So there is no funding schedule required by the state right now for OPEB as there is for retiree liabilities. Uh, there's been a lot of talk over the years about OPEB reform at the state level, uh, but that has not happened yet. Should there ever be reform uh, for OPEB, there would likely be a requirement for us to fund uh, some portion of that cost on an annual basis. I'm going to move to free cash. Yes, please. So free cash, uh, the joke in municipal finance is it's neither free nor cash. It's um, may maybe more regularly called undesignated fund balance. Uh, at the end of every year, in general terms, what we collect in revenue beyond what we've budgeted and any monies that we don't spend that were appropriated um, are calculated by the comptroller, then authorized or signed off on by the Department of Revenue, and that number is verified as free cash with otherwise unencumbered funds that are available at the end of a fiscal year. The town's long-term policy has been to appropriate 50% of the certified number from the prior year as an operating revenue, and that is what is being appropriated or asked to be appropriated under Article 45. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Jameson, on Article 42. So um, Article 42 is there. If you look at um, budget, oh, Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Um, under insurance budget, wherever that is, 26. At the bottom, there are some footnotes that suggest that the money that we're uh, voting here actually comes out of the insurance budget. Is that correct, or have I misinterpreted that footnote? I know the money has to go through the OPEP because our um, I made a motion um, during that town meeting because our. Um, uh, our special act with the legislature was structured in such a way that that had to happen. But on um, the second asterisk, it, under the insurance budget, references the OPEB. Oh, Does insurance. the money go into the insurance and then come back out with the assistance of the comptroller? Or are we appro appropriating it directly? Mr. Chapterlain, Mr. Pooler. Adam Chaplain, town manager, uh, deputy town manager just informed me that we now have the legal ability to do that, but it is not currently how we are um, exercising it. We're paying it directly from the appropriation. But we could move it into the OPEB fund and then pay those costs out of the OPEB fund. Okay, um, we may have the legal, um, but I would, just for future reference, I, I would check the um, home rule legislation that established our fund and make sure that that still uh, is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anything else on um, Article 42? Seeing none, we have before us a recommended vote of the Finance Committee as printed in their book. As soon as Mr. Lathwood's ready, we're gonna vote one for yes, two for no. And go ahead, one for yes, two for no. Unanimous vote, 201 in the positive, zero in the negative. It's unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That ends Article 42 and brings us to Article 45, free cash. We had our explanation. Anyone else wish to discuss free cash? We have before us the recommended vote of the Finance Committee as printed in their report. Four million, four and a half million dollars of free cash. All in favor? Mr. Lathwood, when you're ready. Please press one for yes, two for no, as soon as we get a light. One for yes, two for no.
199 in the affirmative, zero in the negative. It's unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That ends Article 45, brings us to Article 46. Appropriation of the Long-Term Stabilization Fund. $100,000 is recommended vote for the Long-Term Stabilization Fund. Anyone wish to discuss that? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. This requires a two-thirds vote, I believe. Yeah, as soon as we're done with these two. One for yes, two for no long-term stabilization. Two hundred one in the affirmative, one in the negative. It's a positive vote, and I so declare it. And that ends Article 46. Brings us to Article 47, Appropriation Stability Stabilization Fund. Mr. Foskett. Mr. Moderator, Charlie Foskett, Precinct 8, Vice Chairman of the Finance Committee. Um, <clears throat> we have a correction to make to the vote in Article 47. If you remember earlier in the discussion of the uh, school department budget, uh, there was a, a, a increase in the amount of money we received from the state of $150,703. That needs to be added to the $2,635,628 in order to balance the budget. Uh, so uh, that, I'm asking if we could administratively change that uh, number from um, $2,635,628 to two million seven hundred eighty six thousand three hundred thirty one dollars thank you motion to change the amount to two million seven hundred eighty six thousand three hundred thirty one dollars seconded all in favor please say yes, yes. opposed unanimous vote to amend the budget we have now before us a recommended vote of the finance committee as amended for Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund. All in favor, please press yes, one for yes, two for no. It's an affirmative vote, 204 in the positive, zero in the negative, unanimous vote, and I so declare it, and that ends Article 46. All we have left now is Article 3 on the table and Article 27. Can I have a motion to remove Article 27 from the table, please? All in favor of removing 27 from the table, please play, say yes. yes. All opposed? Article 27 is now before us. Um, <clears throat> so we have a recommended vote for collective bargaining. Mr. Chapdelaine, do you wish to discuss it? Or well, Mr. Pooh, is anyone going to, or are we just going to vote it? You want to, yeah, tell us what's going on. You settled with all the unions yet? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, so what before you, uh, what you have before you are the settlements we have reached and that have been approved uh, by both the bargaining units and now by the finance committee and recommended to you. We'll continue bargaining with those units that have not been, um, thank you, that have not been approved yet. Um, and I, I <clears throat> would imagine it's likely we will have a special town meeting this fall to further deal with um, issues of recreational marijuana, uh, dependent on what's voted uh, during a special town meeting. And the hope is that we would bring the remainder of uh, the remainder of the collective bargaining agreements to you then. But we would ask for your support of these this evening. Thank you. Anyone wish to discuss it, Mr. Jameson? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, we just passed the uh, appropriation out of the, re the override reserve fund. Do these monies also needed, did they need to be added to this amount? Or Mr. Foskett, do you have to do anything to this amount, or are we all set? No, they were already included in the budget. These were already included in the budget, okay. And just a comment on the last vote. 
Um, we're getting more money from the state, but we're taking more money from our reserve fund to pay for it. That made, didn't make any sense to me. Thank you most very much, Mr. Slickman. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Any other discussions on Article 27? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote on Article 27, and the recommended vote of the Finance Committee is printed in the report. As soon as we get our green light, we're going to vote one for yes and two for no. It's a unanimous vote, 202 in the positive, zero in the negative. That ends Article 27. Mr. Foskett, if you could take Article 3 off the table and dissolve the meeting. That would be number 18. Mr. Moderator, your... Charlie Foskett, Precinct 8, Vice Chairman of the Finance Committee, I move that we take Article 3 off the table. All in favor of taking Article 3 off the table, please say yes. yes. All Mr. opposed? Article 3 is on the table. Mr. Moderator, I move we dissolve the annual town meeting. All in favor of dissolving the annual town meeting of 2018, please say yes. yes. All opposed? The meeting is dissolved. That was good. I'm now declaring the special town meeting out of recess. And that brings us to Article 2. Special Town Meeting of 2018, Warrant Article Number 2, Extending Recreational Marijuana Moratorium. Mr. Bennell. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Andrew Bennell, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Good evening again, Shh, quiet, Town please. Meeting. Mr. Bennell has the floor. <clears throat> Good evening again, Town Meeting. This is a request to extend the mor moratorium on Recreational marijuana voted in special town meeting, uh, sorry, regular town meeting of 2017. Uh, at the time, town meeting voted to put in place a moratorium through June 30th, 2018. We're now requesting that that moratorium be extended to December 31st, 2018. Uh, the ARB is requesting this extension because final regulations of the Cannabis Control Commission only came out uh, on March 9th, 2018. Unfortunately, that has not been enough time for the town to explore its options as far as how to uh, make appropriate zoning bylaw recommendations to town meeting. We do expect that if this moratorium is extended through December 31st, that uh, a committee established by the town manager will be able to study and review any options available to us and make those recommendations at a special town meeting to be held in the fall, as the town manager had earlier alluded to. Uh, there is the prospect, additionally, for further legislative changes, which may modify the existing regulations that were promulgated in March, uh, potentially complicate the local regulatory process. Therefore, it's an additional reason to extend this moratorium through December 31st. Again, this will allow us additional time to consider the impacts of recreational adult use marijuana facilities, develop local zoning bylaw regulations or other bylaw regulations in response. Uh, in 2013, the town adopted a similar moratorium regarding medical marijuana uh, after the state legalized that and medical marijuana treatment centers. Um, a representative from the ARB will serve on the committee established by the town manager along with stakeholders from a variety of other groups in town. Um, the redevelopment board voted for nothing uh, to put this forth in front of you tonight. I think it makes sense to allow for additional time to study and make sure that the study group in the ARB can move appropriate zoning bylaw recommendations to town meeting in the fall. Thank you. Mrs. Warden? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Patricia Warden, Precinct 8. Fellow town meeting members, the Cannabis Control Commission's rules for implementation 
of the Massachusetts Act re regulating marijuana are 107 pages of close type and should become the baseline for us to build on as well as we can within its legal parameters to safeguard our community. We need extended moratorium time to do this. Please vote yes on Article 2. The demands for us involve mainly complicated safety and to also child development considerations. We do not have enough available land to envision large-scale cultivation parameters. About 100 years ago, East Arlington had 100 acres of glass hothouses for vegetable growth that produced more crop value per acre than any other town in the United States. But those 100 acres are now residential. If that land were still available, it would be a prime target for marijuana cultivators, as was the huge former Lucent campus in North Andover recently. But fortunately, North Andover town meeting overwhelmingly rejected marijuana. Fortunately, East Arlington land is not available. Rulemaking needs adequate time to eliminate potential corruption and to solicit the input of knowledgeable and well-intentioned residents and professionals and for them to develop Arlington's regulations excluding conflict of interest. Huge amounts of potential marijuana profits can be made by those willing to use Arlington as a cash cow. Last year, when Tom Meeting considered a temporary moratorium until June 2018, I described the dangerous situation that the Redevelopment Board had created by neglecting the eloquent and impassioned safety advocacy of the police chief and the director of health. Tonight, we should make sure that the moratorium lasts at least until December 2018 to give proper weight to the advice of these and other safety advocates. We should be able to leave marijuana decisions for adults to themselves except for driving under the influence and for drug-related criminology, and fire and environmental hazards related to residential marijuana growth. We need time to focus on children and young adults and to find out what the school committee can do. Childhood use increases addiction. Of what good? is a multi-million dollar high school building to a marijuana-induced, mentally stunted student of whom there will be many if marijuana becomes a habit for them. Check the scientific literature on the subject if you doubt that. Page 61 of the Commission's regulations cites their regulation for buffer zone requirements at schools. We should build on that. We Will we protect youth centers? What about licensed daycare facilities or libraries? Are school athletic resources and fields to be protected by buffers? I personally have counseled students having a marijuana party beside one of our athletic fields. The commission's regulation does not prevent us from reasonably adding necessary details for buffers in designing our local bylaw. There is no definition of children or young adults in the commission's regulations. The hiatus between high school and early 20s needs to be addressed. Marijuana damages the brain's streamlining process in the teenage and young adult early 20 years, reducing the brain's ability to make judgments think critically, and remember what it has learned. We need the moratorium for transparent process to ensure that whatever marijuana center study group is created is not dominated by individuals who have, in the past, prevented safety measures, or of individuals who have a conflict of interest, such as marijuana entrepreneurs or lobbyists among us. This is our chance to, like the citizens of North Andover, resist the allure of propositioned tax benefits and untold wealth for some, and instead simply take care of our children. About 20 years ago, Arlington residents and town meeting members on our affordable housing task force, on, on which I served, 
created of Arlington's affordable housing bylaw, despite opposition and delays Cycle back to marijuana moratorium, caused please. by the then re redevelopment board. That, that bylaw has been described as the best inclusionary zoning bylaw in the Commonwealth. We now need time to create the best M recreational M marijuana zoning bylaw in the Commonwealth. Please vote yes on Article 2. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Roderick Holland, Precinct 7. Um, the Chinese uh, bureaucracy, Confucian bureaucracy, ran the place pretty well for a thousand years. And um, they had a saying which was, no official business is urgent after three days. Um, a, in our own bureaucracy in Washington, there's a saying, if you don't like something, send it to a committee and slow roll it. Um, it's a term of art. Uh, we voted in this town um, in 2016, if memory serves, 57% uh, in favor of recreational marijuana. Um, and thus far, we, what we've seen is a pretty fine example of slow rolling, mostly at the state level, that, um, you know, has, has left us in this situation today. Um, my question to um, the Redevelopment Board and to Adam is uh, given that, that the article that's on the table is written such that December 31st is a maximum, it's not the minimum for this moratorium to expire, um, and that, that it's envisioned that uh, we can get to work and create the, the necessary bylaws to implement the will of the people in this town. Um, how do you see that working? Uh, has, has there been um, some work already been done since the thing has been around since March from the Cannabis Control Commission? Or are we really starting from zero here? Uh, I'd ap appreciate comments on that. Mr. Chapdelaine, you answer his question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. Um, I, I would say we're, we're, we're certainly not starting from zero. The Board of Selectmen voted for, uh, to put together the membership uh, or the roster of a marijuana working group to be able to study these issues. And I admit it's been a challenge for me to get this group uh, populated and off the ground because of the slow rolling, as you described it, at the state. Um, you know, we, we want to be ready and we, and we want to make sure that we're implementing the will of the voters, whatever it may be, uh, or the will of town meeting, whatever it may be, but doing so in the vacuum or lack, uh, with the lack of information um, could have been a little bit of butting our heads up against a wall. So we're not starting at zero. Uh, town Council, myself, the Director of Health and Human Services, the Chief of Police, the uh, Director of Planning and Community, De uh, Community Development have been tracking these issues all along, I think we have a good sense or as w good of a sense as we can have, even though there's still some conflicts between state law and regulation. So I think we are ready to hit the ground running and come back this fall with a recommendation. Thank you. Way in the back. Tom Michael, Precinct 7. Um, that was a, a, a good presentation about why we should um, extend the moratorium, but I do want to point out that I don't think pending legislation or possible legislation is actually a good reason to extend it, and there was really no reason to add on to that. All the other reasons you gave were sufficient. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Verglu. <clears throat> Thank you. 
of staff of Araglu, Precinct 10. Um, so first of all, my position is that we should not create the moratorium or extend the moratorium. Um, I do have a question. We had a moratorium on the medicinal marijuana, and to my um, knowledge, the moratorium is over, and we still have no progress um, on actually having a medicinal marijuana site. Um, so I think the town uh, bodies, commissions, etc., are more than capable of slow rolling it, whether or not there's a moratorium. <laughs> um, and and I just, I mean, I, I, I want to stay in scope, but I just want to point out the medicinal marijuana situation. I have two close people that I know that basically stayed off opiates by using medicinal marijuana. One has passed. Um, the person that was procuring that medicinal marijuana was going to Brookline and taking two, out or two hours out of their day to go and get it um, while taking care of a sick family member. So, you know, this all feels good to, you know, push it off and worry about it. I, I'm, I'm trying to stay in scope, so I, I just want to make that point that we've done this before and there are impacts on these. This is recreational marijuana. It's not quite a big a need, um, so I'll admit that. The next point I'd like to make is um, at our high school, if you go left and half a block, there's a liquor store. If you go out the back, over the bike path, there's a liquor store. If you go to the left, sorry, I said right, I said left before, so you go right to the liquor store. You go left to the pharmacy where you can get all the opiates you want, basically, if you find the right doctor. Um, if you're getting subscribed Vicodin for a dental thing, please you know, keep it away from your kids because that's one of sort of the gateways. Um, so we have these lures, we have these dangers, if you want to call them that. We also have an excellent barbecue place right across the street, which is its own lure. Um, so, you know, we have, we have these issues. Um, we seem to have zoned in a liquor store in what, the last three, four years, right next to a high school. Um, we zoned in one, I think, six years before that, or give or take, right behind a high school. So these, these temptations are out there. It's up to us as adults to police them, teach our children, um, hold anybody accountable that sells to minors, which I believe the liquor store on Summer Street has had its problems and they've had to change at least management, if not ownership. Um, so we have these tools, we can do these things. Um, we are also in desperate need of a tax base. And you know, this money is not going to some random rich person, it's going to the town as taxes. I don't really, you know, it's an entrepreneurial con country and entrepreneurial town. So I, I think it will get slow rolled no matter what. I don't think there's going to be a marijuana dispensary on July 2nd anywhere in Arlington. Um, and I think that I'd rather have it move forward in, in a regular, expeditious manner, but not with artificial um, extensions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Christiana. Greg Christiana, Precinct 15. Uh, can a member, Mr. Moderator, can a member of the select board or the ARB or town manager or anyone at the tables up front uh, speak to the practical or logistical consequences after June if we vote down an extension to the moratorium tonight? For instance, like would recreational marijuana establishments be able to proliferate with insufficient regulation and oversight or would the status quo likely de like de facto hold uh, through the remainder of the year? Mr. Heim. Doug Heim, Town Council, thank you for the question. So the answer is if we don't zone for it and it's allowed, it can go where it goes. In other words, there's a licensing process that's run by the state, but part of that process um, requires compliance with local zoning and other regulations that are allowed to be promulgated under, that, that can't be inconsistent with the state, nor can they be unreasonable. But we would not have the opportunity to decide what places in Arlington make sense for a um, retail adult use establishment, as well as other establishments. I think one of the speakers previously addressed that it's unlikely that we get something like cultivation in Arlington. But the reality is, is that there, um, from a public health perspective, from a zoning and planning perspective, from, I'm sure, a community safety perspective, there are um, considerations that would, uh, I think the town would enjoy the opportunity to have that layer of process. And I'm sorry to take up time, I just want to make something clear. So the first thing that an adult use uh, retail establishment has to do is have a community meeting. So that takes some time. The next thing that they have to do is execute a host agreement um, with the town. 
And then finally, they've got to certify compliance with local ordinances and bylaws. So there's a lot of layers to what's going on. Um, and that in and of itself uh, would, would take some time. So I don't know that the moratorium is necessarily pushing that uh, dramatically out, but technically speaking, um, someone could have start the, I'm sorry to take up your time, the, the community engagement process today uh, with the idea of being able to open something before the town had meaningful local regulations. Thanks. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Moderator, could you uh, pass along a question to maybe town council, for instance? That um, So if I understand correctly, um, the, the uh, restrictions or uh, uh, the moratorium is, is and that we're looking to extend is regulation above and beyond the state's regulations. Is that correct? Um, Mr. Heim. It's correct insofar as what the moratorium essentially means is we cannot zone out marijuana unless we have a, a very specific process. Um, but the moratorium essentially says we're not allowing it yet and um, until we develop some sort of meaningful regulatory scheme, zoning or town bylaws, um, you know, the, the only thing that's there is a, a state process that is not oriented around where something should be located in a town, the types of local concerns that we would have in Arlington. Okay, thank you. So, like, my personal feeling on this is, like, like given what, what's been explained just now, that um, uh, I, I'm not interested in, in slow rolling the, um, um, the, the moratorium uh, or the, the rollout of the zoning for this, um, but uh, it does seem prudent to uh, take more, a little bit more time to figure out like the, the unique and specific um, um, needs of Arlington and our community and our residents uh, with respect to the rollout of marijuana establishments. So I, th I think I'll be voting yes for an extension. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Deist. <clears throat> Mr. Diggin. What? Oh, well, Mr. Dice, then <clears throat> faked me out. <laughs> so, are you passing now? Oh, okay. <clears throat> John Dice, precinct thir thirteen. I move the question on Article Two. Re motion to terminate debate in Article Two. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a two-thirds vote, and I so declare it. We have now before us the recommended vote of the ARB as printed in their report for an additional moratorium. All in favor, please press 1. All opposed, please press 2. One hundred fifty seven the affirmative, forty seven in the negative. That is a two thirds vote, and I so declare it. Motion passes. And that ends Article Two. Brings us to Article Three. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So I've told the story a couple times now. One was at uh, the State of the Town, and then earlier uh, during the regular town meeting. During the regular town meeting, we had a 10 registered voter article that came before us uh, that was talking about historical, uh, changing the, the rules about historical uh, buildings. Uh, and then during that hearing, it became clear that the underlying problem that the 10 voters were trying to talk about was teardowns. It wasn't really historical, it was more about teardowns. And they agreed, and we agreed, that, the, that their original proposal was not the right tool uh, for solving this problem. And then we had a series of hearings about this. And one of the things that, uh, in particular to me, that became clear was that there's a range of things that happen at teardown. Some buildings that are being torn down in town and re being rebuilt are improvements to the neighborhood, and the neighborhoods are happy. And then there are other teardowns in Arlington where the neighbors are left unhappy after it happens. 
And it is not an easy thing to tell the difference between those two. And then, and then what is even harder is once you think you know the difference between the good ones and the bad ones, is how do you write a rule that prohibits the bad ones but still permits the good ones? And uh, th frankly, that was um, beyond our ability to solve right there uh, in a select meeting during a hearing. And so we chose to recommend to the town meeting to refer it to the residential study group, which was created by town meeting already and is handling a number of very similar issues related to housing, uh, in, uh, residential housing in Article, ex excuse me, residential housing in, Ar in Arlington. Um, and I particularly call your attention to some of the work that they've done uh, that's come out in the past that I think has been very deliberate and helpful, including the creation of the Good Neighbor Agreement and addressing uh, dry law, uh, excuse me, uh, driveway slope concerns. And so for that reason, I ask your support to refer this thorny problem, which I do not think that we can solve tonight, to the residential study group and uh, let them come back with some recommendations to this body on how we can try to separate the good from the bad. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Ma'am. I'm Joanne Creston, Precinct 9, Webb Cowett Neighborhood Preservation Group. Before I start, I know it's late. This is an extremely important issue to my neighborhood and eventually will be to yours, so I ask your patience. I ran for town meeting this year in part to give my neighbors a voice on the issue of teardowns. We've had seven teardowns in our neighborhood and we will probably have many more. Um, slide one. Ah. Uh, we just heard that we didn't know whether it was a good or a bad teardown. This is a house on Webb Cowett. Oh. This is a house on Webb Cowett, or it was a house on Webb Cowett. It was torn down July 27th, last summer. It is in pristine condition. It is a 1920s colonial revival. Thank you, Richard Duffy. I just got his email <laughs> before the meeting. Um, all of the ba bathrooms, according to inspectional services, uh, have been renovated. Um, it is a great loss to our neighborhood. Uh, I would also like you to see all the trees are gone too. All the bushes are gone. The large maple DBH 27, which we learned last week, was <laughs> um, diameter at breast height, four feet. Uh, 27 is a very large tree. Um, it just, it would take 75 years to have another tree of that size. Uh, the only exception Whoops. you see over here is the street tree. My neighbors and I have spent the last more than six months defending this tree. It has been constantly damaged by the developer, his workers, including cutting off a large portion of the roots. Um, and we've had a lot of help from the town manager. However, um, I won't go on to the uh, second slide. This is, this is another house on Webb Collet that was torn down. It was also in excellent condition. All the trees are gone. The shadows are from the street trees, which are large maples. Um, they're gone. So I would like to um, I see at this point we only have a choice between study committee or nothing. So I have three requests I'd like to make. Um, oops, there they are. Uh, could we reduce the amount of time that it's going to take the study committee to make any recommendations? At the moment, I think it's phrased it could be up to a year. Um, I've been told that the last three years we've had 20 to 25 teardowns each year. So every year we put it off and it's also accelerating. Some of those may be good teardowns, but a number of them could be bad teardowns. Um, 
Belmont, Lexington, Cambridge, Wellesley, Woburn, Western, and Watertown all have passed measures to regulate teardowns. We can do it too, and the sooner the better. Secondly, is there no, there's, according to my observations, there's no member of the residential study group that I know of who lives in a neighborhood that is adversely affected. I would recommend that such a person be added to the committee. Um, overall, it would be important to balance the committee among different constituencies. Three, can the residential study group also recommend procedures for enforcement and financial penalties? We need enforcement and penalties to back up regulations. Otherwise, why have regulations? Um, and I would give you, um, we have had a terrible time with this. We, the neighborhood itself had to go and take photographs to show that some regulations have been broken. And I remember one day, we were there with our, our cell phones and the developer and his workers were chasing us down the street saying, we know where you live, you better watch out. We shouldn't have this in Arlington. We should have the, Town manager has been very helpful trying to help us when things are broken, but we need real regulations that are backed up and with punishments that are followed. I would think if someone damages a tree three times, that's the end of building on that lot. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Worden, Precinct 8. Um, I also rise to support the uh, recommended vote under Art Article 3 uh, to uh, establish a committee. Um, the, um, of course, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, Uh, to, uh, to, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke. To, to refer to committee uh, the, uh, the, the pervasive problem of teardowns. And the question might be, why is it taken so long to get to this point? Uh, the, the, the developers presumably have had enough sense not to do a teardown next door to a selectman, but just about every other neighborhood in Arlington uh, has been subjected uh, to this this plague, uh, as, as outlined and described by a town meeting member, um, uh, Mrs. Preston from uh, Precinct 9. The, the wholesale demolition of small houses is both an environmental and a sociological problem. Uh, I recently attended uh, a, a speech or uh, presentation by a, a gentleman named um, Lin, uh, Lindbergh, uh, who's with the Preservation Green Lab, uh, James Lindbergh, his name is. And one of the things, many things he pointed out about the importance of, he was thinking particularly historic preservation, but, but just the, the idea of, um, if they say a lot of these old houses are inefficient, I've heard that, those words spoken on this floor. What he said is, you tear down that little old inefficient house and considering all the, the bricks, the mortar, the, the wood, the labor, the money that went into creating it, it takes 42 years of energy savings to make that stuff up that you've taken, destroyed and taken away in a truck. It also is a sociological problem and, uh, because young couples just starting out need, a, need a, a, an affordable house, and affordable is a lot different than when I came here, um, uh, those houses are being taken away because every time one comes to the market, the developer grabs it, knocks it down, and puts up uh, 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 one of these uh, vinyl McMansions. Uh, and the same with, with uh, uh, elderly people may want to be retired, they may want to downsize, they want a smaller house. No, they're gone, the developers have got them. So we're t we're, we as a community, if we allow this to continue, are screening out people who are important to our community 
young people and old people. And that, Arlington was never a town like that, and I, ho I hope we can keep the way we have been in the past. Um, the, the, um, I, I wish to applaud Mr. Cardin, who, 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 fi uh, who filed the article to start with. I mean, not literally, but that would violate the rules. <laughs> but but, but, but uh, metaphorically, um, because um, uh, the, the, this problem is pervasive. Everybody knows it's here. But the planning department did nothing. The redevelopment board did nothing. The selectmen did nothing. Mr. Cardin came forward filed this article, got it on the agenda, so at least we're having a conversation about it. And it's one of the advantages of this system of government that any 10 voters can get an article before town meeting, and then it's up to them to push it through or get it modified or whatever, uh, but w so we don't have to depend on, on, on the, 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 the elected major officials or the bureaucracy uh, to get things going. So the, um, the solution, however, uh, the, the, his, his idea was to use the, the demolition delay. And as uh, was pointed out, this is not really the way to go. Um, the, the solution, I believe, or a solution at least, uh, was proposed two years ago in this town meeting by the citizens group, and that is to close the loopholes in the large addition uh, uh, bylaw. Uh, so that uh, neighbors at least have a chance to go to a hearing, a public process, make their concerns known. If they don't like it, they can sue uh, and, and have, have a voice in what is going to happen in their neighborhood. And um, uh, finally, um, in closing, I, I would like to ask if the, um, if the developers uh, will observe a moratorium on teardowns until the committee has, um, the, the, the working group, uh, has uh, presented their solution at town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's 940. Let's take our seven minute break so the kids from Minute Man can go home after you buy all their cookies. And then let's get right back in seven minutes because we could really finish up tonight if we work diligently. <laughs> Mr. Revelak has the floor. Please be quiet. Mr. Revelak has the floor. <clears throat> Steve Revelock, Precinct 1. Uh, like the other speakers, I support the main motion of um, referring the demolition issue uh, out to the residential, uh, study study group, residential Study Committee for examination for recommendations. Um, I would like to say a few words about teardowns, and, and this is really just, you know, what th my, you know, me expressing um, a couple of the things I hope that the Residential Study Committee would look for in this process. Now, I've generally considered teardowns as a, as a second order issue, uh, which is to say that, you know, the reason they happen is, you know, they happen because of a, a variety of things. Um, and I'd, you know, I'd like to mention a couple of them. Uh, one is land values. Earlier, uh, you know, the other night, I talked to the uh, director of assessments about, you know, how land pro properties are assessed on their land value and how they're assessed on their uh, the building value and how those change over time. Now we know that property property in Arlington has gotten very expensive over the last few years, but in my observations, most of that expense has occurred on the on the land value side. So for example, um, my own property, a little lot in, e in East Arlington, over the last five years, the house has appreciated 23%. The, pr the land has appreciated 80%. Um, 21 Hutchinson Street was brought up quite a bit during the selectmen's hearing on this article. Uh, over the last five years, that house appreciated 2.5%. The land appreciated 58%. So there's you know, yes, how, property is expensive and it's, it's really all about the land. So what does, what do high property values, what do high property, val, well, high property values, in my opinion, are going to influence what gets built um, on, a, on a piece of land. The median age of construction of a, uh, a residential house in Arlington is 1939. 
Uh, this, that figure comes from uh, the town's uh, 2016 housing production plan. So our, our houses are on the older side and some of them have aged more gracefully than others and the ones that have not aged gracefully will likely need to be replaced. They've, they've come to the end of their lifetime. So if you have a, you know, the, the value of the land is kind of a sunk cost in terms of, you know, you're, the de a developer is not going to make any money on it, um, and they're just, they're just going to eat it and pass it on. Um, and I think this is, I, I believe this is one of the things that leads to, you know, the construction of larger houses. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is um, exclusionary zoning. So exclusionary zoning, just briefly, is zoning that's meant to um, keep a group out typically on an economic status. And when our zoning bylaws were redone in 1975, they were rather exclusionary. Uh, the reason was, well, at the time the town wanted to, they wanted to put a limit on the population. And so in, in all fairness, I think they were just trying to keep everyone out. But, you know, there is a, they, they did studies on this. Um, but, but, the point, but the point about exclusionary zoning is it limits the number of lots, it limits the number of um, houses, which is in turn going to jack up the price, which in turn, I think, will lead people to bring to, um, you know, to replace those aging houses with larger ones. So the, the short of it is there are, there are a lot of variables in this equation, and I would think that a, a really good solution would, um, one, try to approach, not, not take this as an us versus them um, um, kind of conflict with, with developers, but more like a collaborative problem solving. Um, you know, the idea behind negotiation is you want to make sure that the other person comes out of the negotiation get ex exactly what you want. So... <laughs> So there's, um, I just, you know, would encourage the, the study group um, to, you know, to throw a couple of balls in the air because I, I really do think um, an adequate solution is going to have to put a couple of balls in the air. Thank you. Thank you, sir. There's a gentleman in the back. Yes. No, no, not Ms. Ms. Hanlon, not yet. Hi, Len Carden, Precinct 20. Um, I, I was the one that submitted the uh, other article reg for a regular town meeting. Um, this is just a study commission, so I'll be brief. Um, maybe somebody will terminate debate after me. Um, uh, so I was thinking about uh, submitting an amendment to make clear that town meeting found this to be a problem because that's not in the, the article before you. But I, I do hope that the vote will be seen as that. And I do want you to think about your vote um, uh, before doing that because I don't want to waste the time of the residential study group or the planning department trying to address this issue if the, if the town meeting isn't going to really take act on it next year. So you've heard some of the reasons why um, teardowns are bad. That's why I submitted the article in the first place. Um, it's one of the few things that uh, um, constituents have talked to me about, more than one constituent. Um, there's leaf blowers, there's, there was Sanctuary City, and there were teardowns. Um, a couple people have, uh, more than a few people have, have asked me, how can they build that big house? I'm up in the Dallin area where we've had quite a few of them. So you've heard about the issues, but I do want to present the other side just briefly because, um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not quite clear. Some people don't really see it as an issue. Um, you know, as, as Mr. Dunn said, some of the, some of the teardowns are replacing houses that are uh, that are decrepit or inadequate for one, or ugly. Um, uh, it's a free market, uh, and um, some people are just opposed to restrictions on what you can do with your property. Those are all valid arguments, um, and there may be other stronger priorities that we have in town. So please think about that before voting. If you do feel it's a problem, vote yes. If it's not really a, your priority, feel free to vote no, and, and the town will work on something else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Okay. Now we are just voting on a committee here. Remind you all, we're not doing anything. I'm Pat Hanlon, Precinct 5. Um, I have a different perspective from any of the other speakers because um, I live on Park Street, which is often thought of as ground zero for infill redevelopment. And my house, about 12 years ago, must have been part of a leading wave of in-house redevelopment. 
And it's profoundly discouraging to me as a relatively recent arrival in Arlington to have my house and the other houses, many of the other houses on my street referred to as plague and my buying my house referred to as a social and economic problem. Um, but I want to take this opportunity to say that we know less than we think we do about what happens with these infill developments. Uh, on my street, there are several of them that are occupied by elderly people, um, which I count myself since I'm well into my, well into my 70s. Uh, several other people who may or may not count themselves as elderly, but with whom I get along pretty well, uh, and, and some of whom are members of this town meeting, um, uh, also have moved in here after having moved to other places and come back, in my case, to be near my grandchildren. And it turns out that the, pe the houses that live near me that are like mine are largely occupied by people like me who are elderly or by people like my children who have children the age of my grandchildren. And these are the young couples possibly the young people who are helping to contribute to increased school enrollments um, that are also finding these a congenial way to come to what they believe is one of the most welcoming towns uh, in Massachusetts. So I think there's a lot of work to be done by the residential study group in figuring out what the facts are of the situation. And it will not probably surprise you that I'm in favor of this kind of study. I do believe there's a problem. I do not think it is a infill development problem or a teardown problem. It's the various things that can go along with a misconceived project. Tearing down trees can be one of those things. Building houses that are completely out of scale can be one of those things. There are lots of problems that can happen when you are doing something significant, like having a redevelopment in a community that already exists, although some of those communities are more stable than others, and that ultimately makes some difference in the way in which you look at this. The residential study group has already undertaken issues that are difficult, issues that at least tangentially, result, uh, tangentially are related to these, and I think it's well suited for thinking about what the facts are, really, on the ground, whether or not we are plagues or not, or maybe whether we should just put aside the us versus them and leave the welcome mat out for us new uh, citizens of Arlington and begin focusing on the specific issues that make these such burning issues in certain communities. On my way here tonight, I walked along uh, the community that Joanne uh, uh, Joanne said, it's not an ugly community. I certainly see why it is they, they uh, objected to the things they did, the struggles that they've had to try to preserve the trees in that community, I think are noble and that they've risen tremendously to the challenge. Um, and I see why they have a problem. And we heard last week about problems in our tree ordinance that suggests that there are a lot of problems that need to be addressed there as well. The residential study group has an opportunity here to begin putting things together in a concrete context and making some recommendations for us next year that will enable us to make some major improvements in the way our town is run from a land use point of view. And I'm really looking forward to having an opportunity next year to consider the results of their deliberations. Thank you, sir. Mr. Schlickman? Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under all items under this article. We have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It's a two-thirds vote, and I so declare it. That brings us to the actual vote to establish the com tell the committee what to do. All in favor? Yeah. Oh, five people can arise to challenge my determination. Five, okay, let's do a clicker vote. All in favor of terminating debate, let's use the clickers. Vote one to terminate debate, two to continue debating it. One to terminate, two to continue. It has to be a two-thirds vote. <clears throat> I 
157 in the affirmative, 35 in the negative. That is definitely a two-third vote, and debate is terminated. We now have before us the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as printed in their report. All in favor, please press one for yes. Two for no. It's an affirmative vote, 192 in the affirmative, 9 in the negative. That ends Article 3 and brings us to Article 4, Home Rule Legislation, Property Tax Deferral. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. When uh, this, looking towards a tax override, uh, I think I worry about, this is the type, of, people say, you know, what keeps you awake at night? And losing that override vote is what keeps me awake at night. And so I work on, with the town manager on things like, you know, where can we be innovative to save money and where can we be more efficient and how can we change the mix of services that we can deliver. And I look at things about how can we um, bring in other sources of revenue to the town. And the other thing that we also spend a lot of time is looking at is like, how, is how can we make the tax assessment that we're creating as a town um, fair and reasonable. And so there have been a series of articles before town meeting last year, well, before last year, but including last year, including the regular town meeting, and now including here in the special. And these are all aimed at <coughs> making such that uh, people on fixed incomes can have the, uh, making the property taxes uh, more affordable. And so other than, I, I give you that preface but the comment within the article talks pretty well about what this actual vote does. But I wanted you to understand more about the strategy that brings this particular article to town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yontar? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Timor Kaya Yontar, Precinct 7. I rise in support of Article 4 on property tax deferrals. I think that the topic of tax relief covered in Articles 4 and 5 is tremendously important. As you all heard Town Manager Adam Shaftelaine discuss last week on Monday, next year the town needs to vote on a debt exclusion to pay for rebuilding the high school and an operating override to pay for, well, earning the town. These are absolutely necessary. The high school is antiquated and suffering from decades of deferred maintenance and although the town is run in a fiscally responsible manner, our costs simply rise faster than our revenues given the Proposition 2.5 cap. But they are expensive. Together they will increase the property tax bill of the average household by well over $1,000 a year. Nobody likes higher taxes, but next year I will be voting enthusiastically for these tax increases and trying to persuade my neighbors to do the same because they are absolutely necessary. Yet the burden will fall especially heavily on those living on fixed incomes, such as our seniors. Article 4 attempts to ease that by raising the maximum income for seniors to be eligible for tax deferrals. Article 5, though requiring more study, would further help by capping property taxes for eligible seniors at a percentage of income. The articles are two sides of the same coin, no pun intended. Progressive free societies create and empower governments to protect all of the people, especially those with less, whether it's less power or less income. It is the kind and compassionate way to be. In my 17 years on Bates Road, I have enjoyed getting to know the seniors on my block. They are the memory of our community. I have no desire to see any of them forced to move because they cannot afford higher taxes. In sum, I urge you to vote yes on Article 4 as a needed precursor to next year's votes on operating override and debt exclusionary. By so acting, we are doing good and doing what's right. And although Article 5 is a vote of no action, the Select Board has also asked town officials to study the matter and to report back. I respectfully request that they present recommendations including potential uh, warrant articles as soon as feasible and definitely before the 2019 annual town meeting so we may act on them then. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Anyone else wish to discuss Article 4? Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. The language of the article says, um, adopt a higher maximum qualifying gross receipts amount um, than 57,000, which I um, in, in, uh, equate to some number at 57 or bit bigger, larger. Um, can we have any idea what the Board of Selectmen is uh, has envisioning as to what the number might be? Mr. Chapterlain. Adam Chaplin, town manager. When working with the board to prepare this article, we did some research on some nearby communities that had already um, put forward this home rule legislation and had it adopted. And we looked specifically at Lexington that had voted to increase their limit from $57,000 to $70,000. So I think that put a good benchmark for us. But in the time in between, um, if, if the town meeting votes to move this forward, the time in between tonight and when this passes the legislature, we would also work to figure out what the right amount is for Arlington based on, based on the incomes and the demographics of Arlington. But I would, again, think that we're talking about an increment similar to what Lexington has okay. done. Thank you. And uh, just a quick comment. Um, there was been some discussion tonight about land values. And I hope that with um, as much attention is paid to commercial land values, which I believe are under undervalued in town as, the, as as paid every year to residential land values. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McCabe. Welcome. Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on Article 4 and all matters before it. Thank you. We have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? Declared as a two-thirds vote. <laughs> Debate is terminated. We have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as printed in their report. All in favor, please press one for yes, two for no. It's 191 in the affirmative, two in the negative. It's a positive vote, and I so declare it. And that ends Article 4. Article 5 is a recommended vote of no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's a unanimous vote of no action. I so declare it. That brings us to Article 6. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dan Dunn, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Um, so first of all, just a note that this was one of the uh, articles where we put out a supplement with adjusted numbers. And so uh, you should definitely refer to the vote that's in your supplement because we're talking about six licenses, not seven. I refer you to the supplemental report right where it here. says six. six. Uh, just to sh the general discussion that we had at the hearing for this for the Board of Selectmen was to note that we have currently two liquor stores in the east, two liquor stores in the center part of town, and only one in the heights. And we definitely get requests from businesses on a regular basis who are looking to open a store. And we also get some uh, questions about equity. And so it, we're, I'm, we're certainly not making, you know, any, we're not making an absolute guarantee because that wouldn't be appropriate. But we're definitely looking at an, uh, with an eye towards putting a second store in the heights. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, Mr. Helmuth. Eric Helmuth, Precinct 12. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to know if uh, the town has the resources to maintain the same level of underage purchase compliance checks with an additional outlet. If you know, if we add an additional uh, outlet, if we have the resources to maintain the, that program at the same level of compliance per store. Chief Ryan.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. Yes, we combine uh, resources and efforts with uh, Health and Human Services, and there are other resources uh, uh, to do that. We also uh, have grant opportunities as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I want to commend the partnership that Chief Ryan just mentioned. It's a the, the compliance checks are a very well established. There's a well established evidence supporting their effectiveness as a public alcohol policy. Um, and it's a, it's a good way for the town to balance, you know, the benefits of you know, the liquor store. I'd love one in the Heights, uh, but with a responsible uh, view toward the public health consequences that can come from um, from uh, inappropriate sales. Uh, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. Um, well, I just wonder how many liquor stores we need in this town. For a long time, we had zero, and then we had three, and then we had five, and now they want six so they can have two in the Heights. As I'm sure those of you who like their alcohol, which, from which I don't exclude myself, um, uh, a couple hundred yards from the Arlington town line in Lexington, there are two liquor stores with very full inventories. So. Well, I suppose you shouldn't drive there, but you should walk. You could walk there and, and get all the booze you need. Thank you. I, I, I suggest you vote against this article. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Andrew Fisher, Precinct Six. Um, I will vote no. Also, however. I'm rising especially to ask that uh, the license that's offered include the statement that NIPS will not be allowed. Um, correct, me, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the chief of police asked for this to be in the first set of stores. I came to the selectmen and asked why the NIPS got in because the, and it turned out the selectmen had directed that that prohibition be part of it. Um, I always wondered if uh, the reason it wasn't included was that at that time in Framingham, uh, the court had ruled that you couldn't take NIPS away. Um, but I would think that common sense would suggest that if a license was offered and, you know, if the and a, a bidder chose, or a, a business chose to take that license with that condition, it's a free world, they can take it. And there would be no court ruling against the town for doing that. So that is my uh, reservation. And you have to admit, uh, two th I'd like to say two things. I picked up probably 100 nips out of the property at 6 Mill Street when I did the clean out there. I'm always picking them up at the Spy Pond Field where I live. And I kidded the guy managing the uh, Giles store about nips that were on the ground outside of his store. And he went into this very friendly, almost tirade about how he wished he didn't have to sell them because they're a pain in the neck uh, for various reasons. Uh, so thank you, that's my two bits. But vote no anyway. Do, do you want an answer to your question or are you all set? Actually, yes. I'd, I'd like to know what the select okay. would think of that. I mean, Mr. Heim, can you enlighten us about NIPS? <laughs> Doug Heim, Town Council. I'm going to plead the fifth on that, John. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so. The selectmen are allowed to place reasonable regulations on a license. I think we'd have to do an inventory of the existing licenses to see if the specific conditions you're talking about were placed on them. So I, I, the answer is, I don't know 100% for certain, but we, we, I think we'd be all be happy to take a look at um, the current licenses and which ones have conditions on them of that nature. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Freeman. Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. Um, I just really want a point of clarification. 
because the way this is reading right now, and correct me if I'm mistaken, that the current liquor stores can only sell wine and beer, and the way this, is that not correct? So most, most beverages include everything? All right, then uh, thank you very much. <laughs> no, it, 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 malt, it doesn't. But perhaps Doug can clear, clarify the language for us. Because the language says, you know, uh, yeah, licenses it's, it's to confusing. sell all alcoholic beverages. And I was wondering whether that meant that the current liquor stores could amend the license. And um, so, so gonna... what isn't included and what will be included going forward? Doug Heim, Town Council, I'll cop to the confusion on this. These are all all alcohol licenses. Our package stores are all alcohol licenses. There was an error in the original vote, but it's all alcohol licenses. And I also want to point out that town meetings vote, this is a three-part process. Town meeting has to vote for it. It has to go to special legislation that gets passed by the, leg the legislature, and then it goes on a town ballot to add the license before the license would actually materialize. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Weaver? <laughs> Janice Weaver, Precinct 21. Um, I have never been approached by anyone in my precinct in Arlington Heights that wanted a liquor store and the fact that they put one in the meat house is quite ridiculous when, as Mr. Warden pointed out, you can go up the street less than a half a mile to get anything you want and actually have a parking space. As a matter of fact, most people that I ask about this um, uh, liquor license in Arlington Heights think it's ridiculous to even put one there even though I know it was suggested by a board that poor Arlington Heights didn't have a liquor store. And the way the town, I grew up in a town with um, a bar room and a liquor store on every corner. Well, I didn't grow up there. I moved when I was nine to Arlington. That was dry and pretty and nice and no marijuana and no, <laughs> which I don't mind medical marijuana just to make that point clear, but I think C CVS should be the ones dispensing it. But anyway, um, I am against having a uh, liquor store in Arlington Heights, and actually I'm against having a liquor store anyway, but I'll, obviously that's gone by. So I hope you vote no on this article. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Carl? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I move that we terminate debate on the article. Second. Motion to terminate debate in the article. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a two-thirds vote, and I so declare. We now have before us a recommended vote for home rule legislation as printed in the selectmen's report. All in favor, please, please press one. Opposed? Press two. It's a vote of 126 in the affirmative, 67 in the negative. It is an affirmative vote, and I so declare it. 667. Now that closes Article 6 and brings us to Article 7, Home Rule Legislation for Gender Neutral Language. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This article will uh, complete the work of the, we just did in the annual town meeting of changing the name from selectman to select board. And it uh, applies to just about everything in our bylaws and our, um, and the town manager act. And just, we sent out, uh, the uh, town council sent out electronically a sample of what it would look like. Uh, but just to be clear, that sample need not be 100% correct because the actual uh, 
vote that we're taking tonight is printed before you in the report. And so that is, uh, that is, we're not voting on the red line diversion that came out uh, in, on, in your email. We're actually voting on the word changes described in a general way in this home rule and bylaw legislation in front of you. And so we really provided that red line version just kind of a, as a taste of what it would look like when we actually, when the changes are finalized. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Revelak and Mr. Foskett. Okie dokie. Mr. Um, Foskett. Charlie Foskett, uh, Precinct 8, and I rise not as a member of the Finance Committee or any other committee. Um, I rise to confirm my reputation as a reactionary <laughs> aging curmudgeon. And at the risk of uh, raising the ire of a modern day Lysistrata, I rise in opposition uh, to this article. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention that I'm, I think I'm a happily married person for 51 years and hopefully will be after tonight. Um, I have a, a grown adult daughter who's um, professionally successful and I admire her for all of her accomplishments and just as I admire all of the women I work with here in town meeting and in the town and professionally. And I have uh, two granddaughters whom I hope will aspire to the highest levels of corporate or government leadership in the future. So I have nothing against the principle and the idea behind this article. But I have two serious objections. One is that there is a cost to it. Our bylaws are many and complex and have been developed over many years. And it's not a simple matter of using a word processor to change he to she or they or whatever. And I draw your attention to the second point that I like to make in addition to the cost of these changes is the danger that we will indeed be changing the bylaws, perhaps substantively by accident and without due review by town meeting. And I draw your attention just to the and I hate to say this, but the reports of the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen at this town meeting, where we've had numerous errors that have to be corrected, not because of negative intentions or willful neglect by people, but just because these things are complicated and there's a lot of information and material there. Well, think of our town bylaws. First of all, let me ask you a question. How many people have read the bylaws? Okay, well, that's some. <laughs> But, you know, making this change, I think, is a substantial piece of work. I think there's a risk and a threat to our laws. I think a much better solution to this would be for the, board, uh, for the select board to pass a uh, resolution or legislation that could be followed and practiced by town meeting to make every future amendment to any bylaw gender neutral and to make any future bylaw gender neutral without putting the body of our legislative material at risk for error or substantive changes which may have a negative effect in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15, way over quota. Um, I understand Mr. Foskett's argument. I often understand Mr. Foskett's argument, and Mr. Foskett and I love to argue. Um, but I disagree. It matters. It matters what the language in the bylaws is. It matters what the language is that we use every year, everywhere. I spent 30 years of my life trying to convince myself that it didn't matter, but I am the mother of daughters. And I do think that it matters to what young women imagine themselves as when the language implies that the people we are talking about in these bylaws will always be men. And it also matters to people who aren't really sure which gender they are. And I understand that some of us may see that as outside of our comfort zone, but in my family it's not outside of our comfort zone, it can't be. So um, I just want to say that it matters a lot. 
So hopefully we will pass this and we will upgrade our bylaws and hopefully we will not substantially change our bylaws in the process. I think if we take the time and the care and we spend whatever it takes, that we will get there without destroying the bylaw, but it's important that we do it, it's actually overdue. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Sir. Uh, hello, uh, Stuart Ikeda, Precinct 6. Uh, first of all, I want to commend the Select Board and all of us here in town meeting for taking decisive action to uh, change our bylaws to become less exclusive and more inclusive. Uh, I was glad to hear this acknowledgement of some of the uh, costs uh, associated with it. Uh, I would vote for this change anyway. I think it is important. Uh, it does send an important message, um, but change can take time to take root, of course, and I'd just like to know if there has been any consideration to just logistically uh, how difficult would it be to enact these changes? Um, uh, maybe not an exact dollar amount, but online and in certain print materials, uh, I do think it is probably worth the cost, but I'm just wondering if there's a timeline or you know, any planning associated with this uh, you know, as this motion came up. Thank you. Mr. Heim is going to answer that for us. <clears throat> Doug Heim, Town Council. I, I can speak to part of your question, which is the legal process. So the Town Manager Act is actually a relatively discreet document. It took some time to give you the illustrative example. I would obviously go through it again before submitting it to the legislature. The legislature would review it for the same types of things. So the Town Manager Act is not that difficult from the perspective of the time it takes to go through and make all of the changes. The town manager act, I mean, the town bylaws are, it is an enormous document. Um, there are huge sections of it, such as the historic districts, which don't really reference gender a lot. So there are pieces of it that are easier than others. And I do think that I recognize and appreciate what Mr. Foskett is saying, which is that you have to take some care to do it. Every single instance of his or her cannot necessarily be replaced with their or theirs. But other changes like chairman are easy to replace with chairperson, vice chairperson, et cetera. The attorney general's office is only requiring us to submit the vote to say that we'll change these gendered nouns and pronouns. So I'm not under some uh, very, very short deadline to make sure that we certify the votes to town meeting within the statutory time frame. It can take a little longer than that to roll that out. And once that's done on one master document, I don't want to speak out of turn, but in terms of posting it online, or making sure that the clerk's office uh, has the assistance that it needs to make sure that it's got a document with the changes reflected in it. That, from my perspective, would not be, it'll take some time, but it's, it's not something that I think is, 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 imp is impossible or super onerous to do. Thank you. So that the act shall take effect upon its passage is not an undue burden. We could introduce this language in new bylaws and new documentation moving forward and roll it in gradually. So what that, that means two different things uh, depending on what we're talking about. When it comes to home rule legislation, uh, home rule legislation is something that gets drafted and then submitted to the state legislature. Sometimes the state legislature makes amendments depending on what it's about. Um, but they actually have to pass in the, uh, in the state house the legislation that we're asking to amend our town manager act. We don't have the ability to amend the town manager act without the state's permission. With respect to the bylaws, all bylaws or uh, revisions are subject to the review of the Attorney General. They usually take 90 days. So essentially by the end of the summer, um, they approve town bylaw changes. It's a little bit more complicated with zoning bylaws and nobody wants to hear about that right now. But um, so I would have some time over the summer essentially to go through these changes and I would expect everything in the town bylaws to be in order by that um, September time frame. And the legislature we just have to wait on they do things at their own pace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, the gentleman right next to him. Daniel Jalka at Precinct 6. It's true I'm a gentleman. Um, I do present as a male and I identify as a male. 
Um, however, I agree with uh, the emphasis that was made by a previous speaker that the um, vast importance of this is the uh, extent to which it would likely make people who either present and identify as female or as non-gendered or as questioning feel welcomed and uh, covered by our bylaws. Um, as to the uh, fear that we might make some change in the simple replacement of gendered pronouns that would be Irrevoc irrevoc uh, excuse me, irrevocably bad for our town. I don't think that, that that doesn't sound true to me. If anything, I think it's more likely that an unintended consequence would make our bylaws more inclusive and apply more equitably to all the residents in town. Finally, as I said, I do uh, identify as a male and I have, I'm fully aware that it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit uh, overrepresented up here us who identify as males. And if there is anybody waiting uh, in the list beyond me, and if it's legal uh, under the rules of this, I would like to yield the rest of my time to anybody identifying as non-male to <laughs> jump the queue if there is one and take the rest of my time. Well, first we don't yield, and the answer is no, there's no one. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Schlickman's actually next on the list. Such timing. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. Uh, I, I made no bones about it. I really didn't like the term select board, but I abhor gender-specific uh, pronouns within the bylaws. There are too many places. There's a plethora of references within the bylaws that specifically state he shall, he shall, he shall, when we're describing the actions of various town officials. Uh, this isn't elegant. I mean, I much prefer to be referred to as the chair of the school committee, although I don't like being referred to as a piece of furniture. I think there are better names, but getting rid of, uh, when I was chair of the school committee, I'm not now, uh, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey is, and she's a wonderful chair. But um, <laughs> even though she's not a piece of furniture, um, <laughs> I, I think that there is really minimal cost to doing this. There's no cost of doing something in error that's going to mess up the bylaws, and I urge your wholehearted support for this article. Mr. Deist? John Dice, Precinct 13. Uh, I serve with Mr. Foskett, who is a wonderful member of the Finance Committee. However, I am an unabashed liberal uh, curmudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in my opinion, this article is long past due, and I strongly urge your vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wagoner? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I could end the town meeting if I had not said that, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, I think this is a sign of the times in political events, and there is good and bad sides. It's a bad sign when your president has to say he's not a crook or he's not doing business with your enemies. It's a good sign whether or not we say yes or no to this tonight that we're even talking about this. So with that, vote the way you want sooner or later. This will go the right way. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Naomi Greenfield, Precinct 15. A motion to terminate debate. <laughs> We have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. <laughs> we have now before us to recommend a vote of the Board of Selectmen on Article 7 as printed in their report. All in favor, please press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. 1 for yes, 2 for no.
It's an affirmative vote, 190, 182 in the affirmative, 8 in the negative, 182 to 8. That ends Article 7. Mr. Foskett, can you get up and do us the favor of reading number 16? Take one off the, one off the table to dissolve. Mr. Moderator, I move we take Article 1 off the table. All in favor of taking Article 1 off the table, please say yes. yes. All opposed? Mr. Mott. Mr. Foskett. Mr. Moderator, I move that the special town meeting be dissolved. All in favor of the special, dissolving the special town meeting, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Most, the meeting is dissolved. Please return your clickers because we're not coming back. Make sure you bring your clickers back. And please pick up all your recycling and put it in the recycling bins and throw out your trash. We don't want to have our custodian have extra work this evening. He wants to go home early like the rest of us. Please put your clickers back and pick up. Thank you very much, folks. That was a good meeting. See you next year.